right, all right. New recording. Check, 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 check. All right. Okay. Today we are going over disclosures, guys. You guys had requested for us to do a training on how to review disclosures, how to review reports. Um, I'm gonna try to get through as much as I can within one hour, right? But disclosures and reports, like you can, you can literally have one training just on disclosures, one training just on reports. But uh, I want to teach you guys kind of like the quick way to kind of go through it. Like, like yesterday, Mark uh, asked me to look over his uh, file that he was in seminar on. So I quickly pulled them up and within like five minutes of just me kind of browsing through them, I was able to assess, okay, what's going on with this property? Is it good? Is it bad? Are there red flags? And so what I want to preface for you guys is that when you're reviewing disclosures and reports, you guys are not experts. You guys are not contractors, right? So sometimes we want to make ourselves contractors or make ourselves experts or put ourselves in that position but you don't wanna be responsible for the condition of a property, right? Your job as a real estate agent is to advise the client, to point them in the right direction, to help them get the information so that they can make the best decision, right? Obviously you can give them your expertise, you can give them your opinion. The more that you know, you can elaborate on certain things, but there's gonna be a lot of things that you guys come in across with disclosures and reports that you just don't know. There's things that I come across that I don't know. I mean, I've been doing this long enough and we have experience with buying and fixing and flipping properties where we kind of have some construction experience. We work with contractors, but I would say the average agent doesn't have that, right? And so you don't have to be an expert at how like, um, how like repairs work, all those things. You should have the general knowledge. And if you don't know the information, you need to know where to go to find it, right? Or you need to have a resource or you need to have someone you can call. Um, a good example before I go into this is we have a listing right now that Thomas and I are working on and we did the inspections and on the inspections, it came back that on one of the, the breakers, there's like the breaker for the power outside that connects to like the AC, there was like uh, scorch marks on it. Like it was like caught on fire, right? And so like, oh, what the hell, right? Like, so immediately if someone sees that, what do you think? something faulty red flag there's something going on with the with the electrical all that stuff and so i didn't know right even though i have some experience i'm not a i'm not an electrician so i can't tell just by looking at it right like there's many reasons why there could be scorch marks right there could be a faulty wiring there could be something legitimately wrong with it um so what did i do is i have an electrician my my buddy hov that's a contractor i called him i sent him a picture and said hey what can you tell me about this? We're about to sell this home. Should we be concerned? And even he said, he said, look, it's, it could be many things. It could be nothing, right? He goes, it could be maybe the wiring's just loose. And sometimes when the wires are loose, it can cause sparks. Maybe you just got to go, they got to go tighten it in there. And he goes, or it could be like, you got to change the whole thing out, right? So we really don't know until we go out there and take a look at it. So the point I'm trying to make, guys, is that you don't want to speak on something that you don't really know of you want to help the client find the information and then give them the advice and the recommendations of what they need to do. Right. So what we recommended to the guy is like, Hey, I think we should go send our electrician out there. Let's take a look at it. Let's see what's, what's happening. And so it ended up being that like some of the wiring was loose. The breaker was faulty. They had to replace it. It was like 400 bucks, slapped a new one on there. And now we're going to list the property. Right. Um, it wasn't this big, big giant deal. Um, Okay. This is one you got inspections on. This is one we got inspections on, reviewing and inspections we're reviewing the inspections on. before we put the house on the market. Got it. Okay. Right. And so the other thing that you got to think of, guys, is when you go look at a property, you should already know by walking the property, like, is this a newer home? Is it an older home? You can tell just by looking at it, like, is it being well taken care of? Right. So you also got to look for those signs and already prep your client, like, hey, guys, this is an older home. It was built in. 1940 we're walking it it looks pretty original there's probably going to be some deferred maintenance on it. yeah there's probably going to be things that haven't been upgraded over time like hey you see those water stains that means there's probably stuff going on with this house that doesn't mean it's bad that just means like can you deal with it right are you okay with it for some people it's not a big deal like hey 
oh, it's not a big deal. I'll fix it. Or I plan to remodel this property anyways. Right. So there's different, there's different things that can go on. So you have to already just anticipate what sort of property are you dealing with to begin with? Right. What are you dealing with? And so like Mark's property that he's putting an offer on, it's a townhome, right? Townhome. How old is it? Maybe 20 years old, I don't know, 30 years old. Right. But you can tell it's like a newer style, newer construction. It's 30 years old. And so just by even looking at the property, like without looking at the reports, I already knew like there's probably not going to be a ton of stuff going on, but it's 30 years old. There may be a few things here and there. Right. Um, the property that we're going to look at is going to be um, Blanca's listing in Hollister. Just before I even pulled the disclosures, just looking at like the age of the home, um, stuff like that. I mean, you guys did a good job of making it look nice. Um, but I can tell just by the photos, right? Like there's cracks in the driveway, right? Um, photos do a lot of justice. The tile, it's a little bit older of a remodel, right? It looks clean, but I can probably anticipate with this home being a little bit older, the kitchen being a little bit older, even though it's painted and stuff like that, there's probably going to be some things going on with this property, right? Also, the property is how many years old? 69 years old, right? Um, 69 years young, yeah. <laughs> right? So in 69 years, some stuff has had to have happened, right? And and then you got to think like, did they fix the stuff, right? Did they not? Maybe the roof has been changed during that time. Are the windows upgraded? So just when you walk in and just look at the property and use common sense, you know, like, okay, this is a newer home. It's an older home. And then you can kind of already uh, give your client those expectations. Hey, this is an older home. You know, there might be some things going on. Um, any questions, guys? I want to kind of like frame you guys in the right mindset before I go into this stuff, because I think a lot of it is, if you think about it that way, you, you make the process a little bit easier on yourself than trying to get so stuck on like every little detail of the report. Yeah, I mean, what I what I would tell clients is like, you know, buying, buying like a, a used car, right? It's not going to be perfect, right? There's going to be some wear and tear on it. Mm -hmm. So it's, expect that, you know, and that's the job of the inspector to kind of pull all that information. Yeah, it's expected, right? Um, okay, so... What we're going to focus on today, guys, is going to be the seller disclosures and the inspection reports. There's other disclosures, and I'll kind of tell you about them, but I'm not going to go too deep into those. And I also want to tell you the way that you're going to learn these things is by reading them, right? So if it's the very first time you got a client and it's the very first time you've ever looked at a report and it's with this client, like you're already at a disadvantage. So if you want to get good at your job, I would go online and look at homes that are active and the links for the disclosures are usually there and just download the disclosures and just read through them. Look at a newer home that's remodeled. Look at an older home that's not remodeled and look at the difference of the reports, right? So this is where you got to do your own homework and you got to educate yourself, right? And then what you'll find is like, once you look at a bunch of different reports, you'll kind of see like, they're all kind of the same, right? Um, the same format. advice that they're fine there. So like when we walked the property and saw like the stain on the ceiling that wasn't there in the report. Mm -hmm. Um also like in the bathroom because when you turn on the vent like the vent was making like kind of like weird noise. Yeah. Wasn't noticed in the report. So like these kind of things like the termite report was clean. So when you see that kind of stuff, what would you advise your client? Because the seller obviously ran in the front. And they're like supposedly supposed to be like reliable inspection. That's a great question, right? So your question was, what happens when you have clean reports, but then you go to the property and like you notice a couple of things that weren't on the reports? Here's what you got to know, guys, is not all inspectors are created equal. There's some inspectors that are just doing like 10 inspections a day and they're just in and out, right? And they're just like, all right, hurry, hurry. And they miss stuff. And remember, it's all visual too. It's a visual inspection. The inspector isn't going to catch every single little thing, right? So if you see a prop, if the reports don't match up to what you see, that may be a red flag for, hey, maybe we should get our own reports, right? Another important thing that I always recommend when you're looking at the disclosures 
look at the date of the reports. Yep. Because sometimes they're providing reports from when they bought the property, which could have been a year or two years ago. And then also the inspection company. We, you've seen a couple of inspection companies, so they're already sticking in mind. But if it's a whole new company that you don't know about, call them. Just get their experience, get their history. How long have they been in business? How long ha are they in, in area inspectors? Sometimes we have Valley inspectors doing inspection reports out here. So just get an idea, get some background. And then of course, if you're noticing a lot more things than what's on the report, maybe advise your client, hey, you may want to run our own inspections with somebody who likes I did this research. Yeah, and that's why, like, if you're if you're representing the seller, who you choose to do your inspection reports is important, because if they do reports and they're not that thorough, and now the buyer wants to do their own reports, and then they come back with a whole another list that wasn't on yours, now you're going to be negotiating at that point, right? And we've had that happen, you know, where our inspector missed stuff, and sometimes it's just human error too, right? Our inspector missed stuff, or maybe it wasn't raining that day. And so everything was cool. And then like a couple of weeks later, it rained and there's a leak in the roof that wasn't caught during the inspection. Right. So sometimes that can happen. That happened to our other state with Diana. Yeah. Yeah. Our inspection was clean. And then we got a storm. Yeah. Oh my God, there was a major leak. Yeah. <laughs> a storm is always going to expose a lot of things. Yeah. Right. It'll expose a lot of things. So yeah. also depending on like when the report was done. Um, you usually want your report to be, have been done within the last 30 days, ideally, maybe up to 90 days, right? But more than 90 days, you need new reports. Yeah. <laughs> Three days before, right? So it could have been like, maybe, I don't know, maybe it rained from that time and now there's a leak or something, right? That wasn't caught. Or maybe that was like, if they see a leak in the ceiling, they still should point it out regardless if there's a stain. Maybe he missed it. I don't know, right? There could be different reasons on, on why it wasn't caught. But I would say at that point, you got to use your judgment. And you always want to recommend on the error of caution for your clients because your job is to look out for their interests, right? So if you see something, it's not a report, like, hey, I think we should at least dig in a little bit deeper. Let me call the agent. Let me ask them what's going on. Hey, there's a stain in the roof. It wasn't in the report. What can you tell me, right? Um, or maybe they could say, hey, yeah, that's an old leak. It was fixed. They just never replaced the ceiling. Like there's like a ceiling tile right there that has a stain on it, right? Yeah. And that's not that's not leaking no more. They fixed it, but we didn't replace the ceiling tile, right? So sometimes that can happen as well. Um, so look at the date of the report. Okay, let's dive in into a couple of these. Um, so what's cool, like with uh, Home Light, like so if, if they're using like Disclosures IO, which is part of Home Light, I actually like this site because they organize the reports very easy. So it's all in there and like, they're just all like in an easy to read order. Um, what I'll tell you about these reports guys is like, you'll have a cover sheet, right? Cover sheet is just basically going to say like, Hey, these are all the reports we're giving you. Right. That's not, it's just like a, a summary uh, addendums, any addendums that were filled out. You definitely want to look at those because that could be something that they're making as part of the deal or it's an addendum to the disclosures that they filled out. Uh, in this case, they have an appraisal. It's not common that you're going to see an appraisal, but for this particular property, they had an appraisal because of the uniqueness. So I would definitely look at the appraisal. So there's two appraisals, one for the resident and one for the lot. Um, fair housing and discriminatory advisory. These are all part of like the standard disclosures that you fill out. Um, I wouldn't pay too much attention to these because these are just standard disclosures, statewide disclosures that are part of like the listing agreement and the buyer agreement, right? When you, when you sign a buyer. But I think just going into, I mean, cause just saying it with that term, right? Keeping yeah. Like, this is a standard state, state disclosure. Yeah. Uh, I think just kind of finding that terminology, but you're not digging in there and reading the whole thing. And if you don't know, if, if I were to say like, here's what I do, right? Yeah. I don't know. Uh, I'd read it first. But even then I can just like Google what is, and then, oh wait, I didn't copy it. What is, what's it called? Fair Housing Discriminatory Advisory. Housing and Discriminatory. Yeah, we have the same thing on the lending side, guys. We have the same type of disclosures that have to go out. And so we, you know, what I teach our guys is just to really just have a brief idea of what it is. All right. And you guys learned about this when you got your license, right? But like, let's say, if I didn't know, I'm just going to Google it, 
right? So I also want to teach you guys how to like think on your own, right? If you don't know something, that doesn't mean you got to go call me or call Jason. First, Google it. First, try to figure it out on your own. And if you're like, hey, I looked it up and I'm still stuck. I'm clueless on what this means. Then, then you go call someone and ask them, right? But nine times out of 10, because here's what's going to happen, right? <laughs> here's what's going to happen, right? Hey, Amadi has me on speed dial. Yeah. Because <laughs> you'd be surprised, right? Like sometimes the calls I get, like, what color is the sky? And I'm like, dude, like, did you Google it, right? Like, I don't know, right? But where's the bathroom at, right? How do you turn on the lights? How do you turn on the lights, right? But the point that I'm trying to make, there was a joke going on before where they used to call, remember back in the day it was Ask Jeeves, right? They would say, like, Ask Geek, or they would call me Geekipedia, or I don't know, like, they were, right? Because everybody would come to me and just ask me a question when they could just Google it, right? And so what we want to, if you want to become a sharp agent, you need to be able to think on your own, right? You need to be able to go figure things out on your own because you're not always going to have someone there, yeah. right? And so you always want to try to research on your own because that also teaches you how to learn, right? So if you learn and then, and you're like, hey, I read on this, but I'm still confused on this part, then that's where you go pick someone's brain, right? Or, 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 or what I like about that, you read it first and then you're like, hey, 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 Enrique, how would you explain it? I understand it. But how would you kind of break it down so I can shorten it? Well, not even, not even, there's a step further, right? I read this. This is what I think it is. Am I correct? Not like, give me the answer to the test. This is what I think the answer to the test is. What do you think, right? Because now you're actually thinking it through. You're coming up with your own answer. You've done your own research. And then you're going to get confirmation, right? Or they're going to be like, no, you got it wrong. Like, it's actually this, right? But if you do that enough times, guys, you can figure anything out. Right. Nothing is rocket science. Um, so look at just right off the bat, Google, it just tells me right here. It's a reminder. You can't discriminate anybody based off, uh, you know, religion, color, all those different things. Right. That's what that advisory means. And um, that's even when I explain these. Hey, guys, like this document right here, all this basically means is we can't discriminate anybody from buying or selling a home. Right. There's like three pages that explains that. I'm going to go ahead and send it to you for review. But that's basically what it means. Do you have any questions on that? That's how I explain that doc. I literally summarize it in 10 seconds. Do you have any questions on that? Nah, makes sense. All right, let's move to the important stuff, right? Um, same thing with all these possible representation of more than one buyer or seller. You guys know what that is, wire fraud. Um, the one that we're gonna focus on is a TDS, real estate transfer disclosure statement and seller property questionnaire. The visual inspection also, um, these are not always the best guys. Like some agents just go in there and just, just like put garbage on those, right? Really the inspections are probably what you want to look at. The visual inspection is just the agent walked the property and they said, hey, there's a scratch on the floor. There's a mark on the wall. There's this, like they don't honestly like look through them, right? To see if anything stands out. But nine times out of 10, it's just like, it's meaningless in my opinion. Um, earthquake disclosure. We live in California, guys. There's fault lines everywhere. There's earthquakes, right? That's basically what that means, right? Um, FERPTA, this is basically like uh, your tax status, right? If you're foreign, non-exempt, right? You got to like mark that on these disclosures, you know, um, not a big deal. Lead-based paint, some houses have can have lead in them if they were built before a certain time, they were painted before a certain time. All these things. I'm not going to get too much into these guys. Let's focus on on the ones we got to really look at. I'm trying to see if there's anything else that stands out that's not um, just common sense. I focus on that, but can you just again? I know you touched on the first how you briefly just give a you know a few like a summary. Is that what you would do with all of these? How would you actually present it? Yeah, great question. How do I present this? So what I would do, guys, is I would send all of this to the client, right? right? Just to cover myself. You're going to have some clients that don't even read it. To be honest. You're going to have some clients that read every single page because it's like a couple hundred pages, right? But as part of your fiduciary duty to your client, you need to give them the documents. If they don't read it, that's on them, right? Like you can't make someone read a document, but they can come back and say, well, you never gave these to me, right? So I would never have a client move forward and you never give them the inspections and they're only going off of your word, right? Um you are not responsible if someone doesn't read something and moves forward, right? Um, so 
I would send them to them. That's what I would do first is I'm going to say, hey, I'm going to send you all of these documents, right? It's a lot of stuff. The main ones that we're going to focus on are the inspection reports, right? And we're going to focus on any of, you know, whatever the seller wrote down that they know of the property, because that's really to find out the condition. Um, and I'll, I'll make a couple notes of what I think is important, but go ahead and read through them, you know, if you'd like. It's a lot of pages. And then once we meet, we can go through everything and address any concerns, right? And that's how I would present them to the client. And then when I'm meeting with them, I would ask any questions. Do you have any questions on this one? Do you have any questions on that one? Um, and then I would dive more into the inspections, right? That's how I present it. Uh, is it best to send disclosures even sometime before you meet at the place? Or should you view the place first and send disclosures? Is it good to send disclosures before meeting at the place or view it first and then send them? Um, I think you should check them out before you go view the place, right? Like if you know your, your client's really interested in this property, you're going to go see it. It's a hot property. Things are moving fast, right? It's probably going to get offers. I would say you as the agent, go check them out. Kind of create a little cheat sheet. Like, hey, like these are the five things that we probably got to pay attention to. And then if you look at it and they like the property, then I would send them the disclosures. Because what if you go there and they don't like the property after all? It's too noisy. The rooms are too small. Back And then you sent them all these documents for them to review. I think we only review those disclosures in detail if they want to move forward or potentially write an offer, right? So you save time. It's more efficient that way. But you as the agent being knowledgeable, you should do your homework on the property so that when you're showing the home, you can show it to them and point out certain things that you noticed, right? That's what makes, that's why you're the professional. Metro's tons of value, guys. Tons of value when you research it and you bring that up while you're telling it. Yeah. Right? And I think too, it's going to depend, do we, on your client? Like, because some clients, I have a client who wants to see the disclosures before seeing the home. Yeah. To them, it's more important to know what condition it's in. So it's going to be what Enrique says and then just kind of what, how they like to work or yeah. how they like to see. But if you go through it and you definitely see some things that are red flags, like he said, do a little cheat sheet and let them know what happens. And then when you're there at the property, also bring it up. Hey, this is what I was talking about in the report. Yeah. And what you could even what you could even do is you could even ask your client, right? You could say, hey, guys, this is typically how I work, right? My job is to kind of do the homework for you. And then if we're going to move forward, then we'll all look into it in detail, right? But if you prefer that I send you all the disclosures, got a couple hundred pages, I just don't want to send you stuff that just clogs up your email, right? Um, and some clients may say, no, I want to see everything, right? You have some clients that just are like that. They're real meticulous. Um, and some clients that are like, no, you know, we'll cross that bridge if we get there, right? Okay. Um, and what that demonstrates when you ask your client that, that demonstrates your professionalism, right? That demonstrates that you have an actual process of how you do things, right? And that sets you as the authority when you, when you handle it that way. Cisco? And so to, uh, um, or like, we get like the solar flex calls and like sometimes they'll have like the take off for deadline is the day or the next day. Mm -hmm. You're going to meet them for the first time on your cover sheet. Sometimes they'll say that it has an offer deadline. So you don't want to like throw that to them because you don't want them to like be scared of like, oh, we saw that there's an offer there, like never mind, we don't want to see it. Yeah. Time. Yeah, that can happen too, right? Yeah. Where that kind of scares them a little bit or puts too much pressure. Let's dive into the reports, guys, because we're not going to have a lot of time to go through this. These are all good questions, though. And we can we can break this up. If we got to break this up into a part two, that's not a problem. Um, so first thing I'm going to look at, guys, is the TDS, the seller disclosures. So you have the real estate transfer disclosure and the seller property questionnaire. These are the disclosures that the seller is required to go in there and fill out and check boxes of what they know or what they don't know. All right. So let's pull up the transfer disclosure one. And so what's important to understand with these, this is not going to necessarily mean that it's 100% accurate, right? This is what does the seller know to the best of their knowledge, right? They live there from what they know to the best of their knowledge. This is what's going on with the property. This is what's included, what's not included. But remember, the seller is not a contractor, right? And the seller isn't walking around checking out the roof every single day or climbing on the roof, right? The seller isn't listening inside the walls to see if there's a leak inside in the plumbing, right? So it's all just what do they know to the best of their knowledge, right? Um, and most homes, guys, if it's a, if it's not a brand new home, 
there's things going on with every single home, right? Every single one of your cars has something going on with it, right? At any given point, oil needs to be changed. There's a leak, whatever it might be, right? It's part of the maintenance. So you got to kind of take this with a grain of salt and then look into things further if there's like some red flags, right? So this first page right here is going to tell you a couple important things. Is the seller occupying the property or not? Because that's important as well. If the seller's not occupying the property, do you think they're going to know every single thing that's going on as much as someone who is occupying the property? So if there's tenants there, they probably don't know much going on with the property, right? The tenants probably know more than the seller. Um, in this case, the seller is occupying the property. All these boxes right here that they are checking, they are saying this is what the property currently has. It has a range, it has an oven, it has a dishwasher, it has a garbage disposal, right? All these little check boxes. I'm not going to go through every single one, but it's just going to tell you this is what it was included with the property right now. This is what's currently there. Um, you'll see like what type of roof it is. What's the age of the roof? Is there a fireplace? Stuff like that. Right here, other uh, solar panels, uh, remainder of roof unknown, right? So that's going to like tell us, hey, maybe something's up with the roof, right? Might, might want get to get that checked out. They're going to tell you, is there any significant defects or malfunctions in any of the following, right? This one is no, but I don't know. This could have been a yes, <laughs> to be honest, right? Um, because for a seller, like what we tell the seller is like, let's just list everything and provide the reports. Like this is everything this is what you're getting, right? It's better to over disclose. But this is if they know if there's any significant defect with the walls, the ceilings, the floors, the exterior. And if they check yes, then they would have to put an explanation. So they can say, okay, walls, and then they can just put like, there's a crack in the wall, right? Or something like that. So just read through these guys. Can they put C report? You can't, or they have to actually put something? They can put uh, either. They just have to give some sort of ex explanation. Okay. Like yeah, you could say C inspection report, right? If it's noted on the report, they can just, you know, so that's why also when the sellers do reports up front, it actually protects them because they're over disclosing, right? So it's always recommended to do reports because they may not know something's going on, but it's ca caught in the report and it's being disclosed to the client through the reports. Or sometimes when the sellers have lived there so long, for them, something that's a defect is normal. Yeah. Just because they've been there so long for them, it's like, oh, it's not a big deal. Yeah. So, like the, the faucet doesn't turn on unless you hit it a couple times, you know, but that's just the way we've been riding for like last 30 years. So for us, it's not a big deal. Uh, but really, like on the report, the pipes are about to burst, right? Like that scenario that the exhaust is loud. Yeah, and exhaust is loud. Like they're already used to it. It's yeah. not a big deal no more. <laughs> so, so you're saying that if you have a So having an exhaust that's loud, it doesn't mean something's wrong. It could just be like there's a bunch of dust in there, it needs to be cleaned out, right? It could just be like, it needs to be greased and it's so it could run smoothly, right? Um, so like everybody has a different level of standard at which they live too. And you'll know that when you walk in the house, like, this looks kind of dirty. Or like, oh, like this house is super clean. Like, does anyone even live here? Like, it looks super clean. You could tell when you look at like the baseboards and stuff like that. Like if there's dust all over the baseboard, if there's marks all over the walls, right? Like if the stove is all dirty, like you could tell how people live, right? Everyone lives differently. Um, but you gotta, you gotta just take a look at that stuff. Um, this right here, these next set of questions, right? Like, are there any stuff, substances or materials that could be hazardous, right? Any features uh, that are shared with any of the neighbors, right? Almost every property should say yes, because fences are typically shared. So you're gonna see yes on that one. That's pretty common. Any encroachments or easements with the property? This particular property had an easement. Um, any room additions, modifications, anything that they've done without permits, right? A lot of people do stuff without permits, guys, just FYI, right? Like, hey, my uncle built a little shed back there. We rented out, like, no permits. That happens a lot, right? Um, and you need permits. Technically, you need permits for everything. If you change a window, you're supposed to get a permit. A water heater, you're supposed to get a permit for the water heater. But I would say probably 90% of water heaters are changed without permits, right? Um, so just FYI, and that's the city's way of making money. Um, so you just want to go through these questions, guys. Anything going on with the rooms, with the structure? Uh, 
any settling, meaning there's the soil moving, is the house settling, the foundation, anything they know of. This is all, remember, everything, anything they know of. And this one, they put yes for neighborhood noise problems and nuisance. And so if you see yes, that's item number 11. And you look down here, number 11 is there's a high school next to the property. Is it right next to it? Yeah, block them. Yeah. So if there's a high school down the street and you can hear kids, you want to disclose that, right? Doesn't mean something's wrong. A lot of homes are next to schools, right? But anything that they check here for yes, there's going to be an explanation here, right? So the high school one block away, there's children, there's games, there's lights, it could be noisy. You're buying a home next to a high school. Um, that's pretty much it, guys, on this one. This one's very simple, the TDS. Any questions on this one? And hey, Keegan, when you, you're going over this with the client, like the way you just did right now with us? Yeah, what I what I do is I kind of just, I kind of cut to like the yeses, okay. right? I've sent it to them and say, hey, guys, I sent this to you guys, you get a chance to look at it. Let's kind of go through the things that they marked as yeses. Everything else is pretty much a no. But the things that they said that they noted are these things right here. So I kind of summarize it for them, right? Um, I'm just going into a little more detail with, with you guys for training. But really, you want to scan through it first. And that's what I did yesterday with Mark. I just looked through it. I said, okay, here, here, and here. These three things. Are you guys aware of this, right? Mark's like, yeah, we already know about that. Died in the house. Someone died in the house, right? That's going to go on the next one right here. So seller property questionnaire. I honestly don't know why they have like two different documents for this. It should just all be on, it should all just be one because it's kind of redundant a little bit, right? And so it's it's a similar questionnaire where it's like anything the seller is aware of. So are there any documents, are there any reports, inspections or disclosures that you know of for this property? The answer is yes, because we just did the inspections, right? Property inspection and termine inspection. Okay, in the last three years, has anybody died? This is another important one. So this is always going to show here. Um, on marks, they said yes, and then it had an explanation, natural causes, someone, the wife died last year or whatever. I don't know what it was. And they don't have to disclose if they did it the last property, right? So like, say the owner died, but they died at the home. Um, it says right here, note to seller, the manner of death may be a material fact to the buyer and should be disclosed except for death by HIV or AIDS, right? Or does that give the material Because the way someone died, mean it can, mean, it can make a difference in the buyer's decision to buy the home. So if someone got murdered on the property, they're probably going to want to know that they got murdered, right? Fine. Suicide, murder, you know, some crazy accident. I don't know, right? Things like that, gunshot. I don't know, right? Whatever, gunshots. Yeah, how someone died is a material fact because nowadays people make their decision on buying a property. Like people are okay with people dying, but it's how they died. A lot of people have superstitions. Is there going to be a ghost? Is there going to be all the religious things, right? Like stuff like that. If someone died naturally and peacefully, right? They were older. They died naturally and peacefully. They lived there forever. A lot of people aren't really tripping about that. Like I've noticed that most people don't really care if someone died in a house, if it was natural and peaceful. There's certain maybe religions that maybe do, like they just don't want death at all. They think it's bad luck or something. But for the majority of people, if it's natural and peaceful, it's not a big deal. Now, if they got murdered, that's going to scare off a lot of people. The majority of the people will be scared off, right? So basically, you can use that to disclose how they died. Yeah. Okay. And also to Molly's question, the material fact, we were submitting on a property in Seven Trees neighborhood and that it was known to have like um, issues going on with the homeowners with um, a shooting. So they, <laughs> so they attached the police report. Yeah. They attached all the police report and everything. So, so the material fact, let me, yeah, a material fact is something that is going to influence the decision on whether to move forward and that could potentially affect the property value. That's a material fact. It's a key fact that would make someone go left or right. If it was more than three years ago, you don't have to disclose it. But if someone finds out later, I don't know. I, I, I would err on the side of caution. I don't know. That's kind of a gray area right there, right? Technically, if it's three years or more, 
You don't have to disclose it. But if someone got murdered four years ago in the house and you're like, it's probably been on the news and people know about it. Right. Like, like I might as well disclose it because I don't want that coming back at all during the process. I don't want the deal to fall apart. What if someone says like they don't. OK, this is hypothetical. Someone got murdered four years ago. You don't disclose it. They make a non-contingent offer. Right. They move forward halfway through. They talk to the neighbors. They find out someone was murdered and now they want to back out. And they're like, you didn't tell me. And you're like, well, it's been more than three years. Yeah, but still, that's like a material fact. That's something major. You should have disclosed that. Now I'm suing you for my deposit. You don't want to release a deposit. Now you're in court. Right? Or they're like, hey, I'm not buying it. Like, take my deposit, but then I'm going to try to sue you for it. Yeah, because that was a material fact. Disclose. Always disclose, right? So when you're representing sellers and that there's something like that, you always want to advise them, disclose. Honesty is the best policy. Right. The sellers knew, but they didn't tell you. The sellers knew. Material fact, if the seller, no remember, like, yeah, you don't. Yeah, the the seller is signing these saying. Right now, maybe that's not answering the question of three years to the death, but I think there's another question: Is there any material fact that would affect the property value? Like just a blanket statement? I think they have to say yes or no. Right. Um. Okay, let's not get stuck on too many scenarios, right? Common sense though, right? This is where common sense comes into play. Is it gonna affect someone's decision to buy or sell the home? If so, then you wanna point it out to the buyer, right? And you wanna make sure the buyer knows about it. Hey guys, they checked this box that says this. Are you okay with that, all right? All right, let's move forward. Insurance claims. This is another one right here that people often overlook. If you do an insurance claim on your house, let's say like a pipe burst, insurance pays out 30 grand to fix everything like that property you're gonna list right now, that insurance claim stays with the property, right? Because then when they go try to get insurance again from the new, the buyer gets the new insurance, they run a, re a report to see if there's ever been, ever been any claims on the property. So that's gonna pop up and some insurance companies may not want to insure the property or they may wanna charge more, right? And so that can affect it, right? So the seller's gonna to have to say yes and put the details of that, right? Um, any matters affecting title, anything to do with the plumbing, look at right here, any material facts or defects affecting the property, not otherwise disclosed to the buyer. So that's your past four years. Someone got murdered right there. <laughs> right. Um, and then it even asks again about repairs and alterations. Like it already asked this on the other one. So it's kind of redundant a little bit. Um, but this is where they can put some specifics, like we painted, we did this, we did that. Any systems or appliances, right, um, that have any defects? Is there an ADU? Like, there's they updated this one to have stuff about ADU. Um, this wasn't there before. Any insurance or settlements that have to do with disaster relief, like Hurricane Katrina, right? Like, if that happened and there was, like, some settlement that happened with the government, you got to disclose that, right? Um, any water related or mold issues, any pets or animals or pests on the property. If you have a dog, cat, you got to let them know because dogs and cats pee or people have um, allergies and stuff like that. Boundaries or access to the property or any use by other people. This is common in like rural areas where you have ranches and like there's a road that's shared to get onto the property. You got to let people know, hey, you're sharing a road with these uh, the neighbors. All right. Um, Landscaping, pool, spa, condo. If it's a condo, then you have to answer all these, right? That's more information about the condo. Anything that has to do with affecting the HOA, that has to all be disclosed in there as well. Anything that has to do with the title, the ownership, any liens, any legal claims, anything like that. If there was lawsuits against the property, any legal things that happen with the property, you got to disclose all that. Um. Correct. So the title of insurance is ensures that the property is being transferred clear of any liens. If they cannot transfer the title clear of any liens, then they won't ensure the transaction. And they're going to tell you, Hey, we can't, we can't work on this file. Um, if something comes up later, then the insurance covers it. 
But the title company does a pretty good job of running everything ahead of time because they also don't want to pay out insurance, right? But every once in a while, something will come up that was unknown. It doesn't, it's not very, it's not as common, right? But it could come up after the fact, like, hey, there was this old lien that showed up and it wasn't filed correctly and the seller owed it or whatever, and it just didn't get handled. And so title insurance can kick in there. Um, this never came across. Yeah, I know, right? Uh, no, I mean, but you'll have situations like sellers and bankruptcy, right? And that is tied to the property. So there's all these things that have to happen. Seller owes uh, money to the IRS and it's a lien on the property. And in order for them to sell the property, they have to pay that off. Maybe the seller doesn't want to pay it off because it's a lot of money and it's going to take all his profit. So you need to know about those things because then that could jeopardize the sale, right? Um from even happening. What if the seller's like, hey, I'm not moving forward. I can't clear this thing with the IRS. They want 100,000. I don't want to give them 100,000. I'm just going to keep my house. I'm not going to sell it. And then you already moved forward with the property. You already did your inspections. You already got your loan done. You're like ready to move in. You're right. So this is why you need to know like anything that's going on with the property, um, with the title of the property. Child support too. That's common, right? People with child support. The IRS wanted to Right. That's what we're IRS stuff can kill a deal because what I found is that if people owe money to the IRS, a lot of times they don't want to pay it and they want to like, let me work something out with the IRS. But in order to work something out with the IRS, it could take months to like go through this whole application process or I want to settle with them or whatever it might be. And that can delay the process. Right. So IRS is something that can kill it. If they're going to just pay it off completely, then it's fine. Right. That's why as a listing agent, you, you want to make sure they get all that information up front so that you, they know exactly before you list the property what they're going to do. Yes. Question. Uh, so in that situation, let's say they do owe the IRS, would title company just automatically pay the IRS? Um, I mean, with their permission, right? But title the title company runs something called the Statement of Information. So anytime you're going to sell a property, they you have to fill out like a questionnaire. It's almost like a credit check or a background check. You have to put your social where you work that they run it through a system and then it runs to see if any liens pop up against you right and sometimes like an old like collection will pop up right and it wasn't on the property but it's attached to your name and it's a legitimate collection they got to pay it off so the IR, the title company will say okay if you want to sell your home this has to get paid off right and that becomes part of the the net sheet right uh okay Again, it's asking you about neighborhood noise, nuisance. This is kind of redundant again. It's asking you about anything with the government that's affecting the property. Um, anything else? Anybody smoked on the property? Um, anything smoking? They're even saying vaping now, right? If you vaped in the property, you got to disclose that. A lot of these have been updated over time because I remember this wasn't in there before. Or cannabis. Or cannabis, medical marijuana. That's a big thing now. Like that wasn't in the reports back in the days, but since a lot of people um harvest or smoke or whatever like they want to know about that stuff as well so stop stop smoking guys all right <laughs> uh all right <laughs> any questions guys on the two seller disclosure statements yeah, guys really quick I, we only have 10 minutes and i know rick is going to do a second part of this but i really want to get down to what questions you guys have in agent because this this training has came up a few times so what question is it the way he presents it into the certain disclosure just for the last 10 minutes, I would really yeah. focus on something that really, I think what we'll do is we'll, we'll stop here yeah. and then we'll more go into questions and then part two, we'll go into the inspection reports. Right. Okay. Um, because I think there's a, there's enough here doing what you got. So I know right now, um, what I heard from her was, Okay, so your uh, Dewey's question is in regards to condos, townhouse, and their HOA docs. So we didn't talk about that here, but if there's a condo or a townhouse, they have an HOA. The HOA has to provide all their documents that tells you where the condo, if it's in good standing, it's going to tell you about like how much money they got in the bank. Because remember, the HOA is a business, right? They're a business that manages the whole complex. So they manage like repairs, insurance claims, you know, maintenance, all those different things. So what Dewey's referring to is reserves, meaning how much money do they have in the bank? 
So, you know, when you pay your HOA payment, say it's 500 bucks a month and they're collecting from a hundred different people, all that money goes into a fund. And then with that fund, they manage the HOA, right? So you want an HOA to have enough reserves in case something happens, they have money in the bank. Um, for example, let's say like the roof needs to be changed and it's a condo complex and it's a giant roof that covers, you know, 50 units, right? That's going to be a big expense. So um, if it's an older complex and you know some of these things are coming up, does what are the plans that the HOA has? Do they have the money in the bank? Are they planning on fixing this stuff? Because what happens is when they don't have enough money in the bank and it has to be done, then who are they going to charge? They're going to charge the owner, right? So they're going to say, hey, guys, we have to fix this roof. It's falling apart. There's not enough money in the bank. So we're going to do something called a special assessment. A special assessment is we're going to divide it up by everybody. And now you're going to owe this additional money and it's going to be attached to your property, right? And so whenever you sell your property or refinance, you're going to have to pay this off. Uh, I remember there was a property that I sold that was a condo and they had a $17,000 special assessment attached to it. And it was for like some big like overhaul that they did on the whole entire unit, right? So when they sold the property that had to get paid off, right? Um, so to answer your question about how much reserves you need, I don't know the answer to that question. I would say the lender may have a certain requirement. And so I think the best person to ask is going to be the lender right? Hey, and the lender does something called uh, HOA cert. So whenever you're going to buy a condo, the, a, the, a, the lender sends a questionnaire to the HOA and asks them to fill all that information out. How many units are there? How many are owner occupied? How many are rental? Um, how many people are behind on their HOA payments? How much money do you have in the bank? All these different things. Is there, are there any lawsuits pending? Because people sue HOAs all the time. Let's say you're walking like and you trip and fall, and then now you want to sue the HOA, right? And so all those things will affect your ability to get financed. So the best thing to do when you're working with that is to get your lender involved and maybe send them the docs and say, hey, can you check this out real quick and let me know if we're going to have an issue getting financing on this, right? And then the other thing you can do with HOA is you can also call an agent who sold a unit already and say, hey, I saw you just closed on this unit. You guys just sold this unit. I'm actually representing a buyer. We're going to put an offer on this one. Were there any issues with financing or with the HOA? Because they just went through a transaction. So they'll be able to tell you right off the bat, yeah, you're going to have an issue or no, everything was cool. Right. And so um, some things that can affect the financing is like delinquency on the HOA. So let's say you have like a hundred units and like half the people are behind on their HOA payments. Then that's not a really good, that's, that means they're not managing it right. That means they don't have a lot of money in the bank. Or let's say like more than half of them are rental properties. They're, they're non-owner occupied. That's riskier to the, the lender because if it's non-owner occupied, that's more of a risk to the, the person owning it, right? Are they managing it properly and stuff like that? Um, so there's a lot of things that can come into play if there's not enough reserves, if there's a lawsuit or litigation that can affect it as well, right? So you'll usually know if homes are not selling, right? Or right, or if something just sold then that, and it sold with financing, then that means it was able to get it done, right? So that's why calling the listing agent too is, is important to find out. Uh, what else you guys got? Questions? All right, so you guys are experts on this now. <laughs> question regarding material facts so uh -huh. um i know you mentioned like there's two programs right one is the last three years and one is the one beforehand right what if you come across like a property that's like you can clearly see there's a material like defect in it, right? but there's nothing that's disclosed like i'll give you an example right i checked out a home um san jose across from a high school the entire um basement was basically a bar <laughs> putting it conservative it was conservatively a bar or more of like a dance bar, right? But when you look at this disclosure, kind of absolutely bar. nothing. Like, I'm not making this up, right? There's nothing stated about that at all. And the home's been on the market for 130 days. Right? So, the, so, yeah. so let's distinguish material fact from just like condition of the property. Material fact is, is there something going on with the property that would affect someone's ability to buy this home or would affect the property value? Having a bar in your basement, that might actually increase your property value, right? 
Because if I'm going to buy that property, I'm like, hey, it comes with a man cave and a bar. Like, I, I want that. It's already set up, right? I bought my house because it had a built-in room in the garage that was a studio for my music equipment. That was one of the reasons I bought that house because then I wouldn't have to go build something myself, right? So you got to distinguish material fact from like, just like, this is what the house has, right? Material fact is like, is there something negative going on that can affect the desirability, That's the word. desirability, the property value, the ability to buy it or to resell it, right? Now, here's a material fact, right? In the backyard or right behind it, there's those big old towers, those uh, electrical towers, right? That's a material fact. I mean, it's pretty obvious you'll see it, but that's a material fact that can affect, you know, the desirability, right? Yeah, and, the and the financing, right? And I don't know if that affects your health. Like, if, hey, if you're too close to that, turn into you turn into an AI robot or something, right? Um, but that's the material fact, right? The material fact is definitely if someone died on the property or if it was like a like a crazy type of murder. Um, I don't know. A material fact that can maybe just flip it the other way. What's a material fact that can increase the value of a property? There you go. What? Yeah, you took celebrity. Yeah, celebrity lived there, right? That's a material fact that can increase the desirability or likability, right? Hey, this was Kobe Bryant's house. House, right? And you see that all the time. Like just because it was their house, it sells for more, right? Um, so that's a material fact that can go the other way in a positive direction, right? Um, and here's here's something that's cool, right? Like I'm just material. This is where now Google comes facts that affect real estate. So material fact, right? Any information that can significantly impact the buyer's decision to purchase the property or affect its value. It didn't say negative or positive. It can go either way, right? Um, material facts, examples. Yeah, I think that's, that's, it's important to keep the, your opinion out of it because we don't know what's valuable to show. Like yeah. you said, a bar made intriguing. Yeah. yeah, examples of material facts, right? Examples, a non-compliant pool. Like, hey, they built this like bootleg swimming pool in the back, right? Non-functioning air conditioner, foundation work, right? That's not really visible. Like, right, there's no cracks, but, like, this whole area, um, if anybody's been in Blossom Hill, like, Comanche streets, like, 951, there's a few streets over there where all the streets are, like, they're like this. Like, there's something going on with the foundation, uh, the soil, right? Or um, And almost every street is cracked. And you see that some of the houses are shifting. Um, that's a material fact. Previous work done on the property, windows need repairs different building materials, which other parties may have added, pest problems, like, hey, this property has roaches or fleas or anything, right? Uh, my dog had fleas recently. Like, those things are a freaking pain in the butt to try to get rid of, right? Luckily, we, we got rid of them finally, um, but after a couple of times of them coming back, right? But, like, if I was going to sell my house and there's freaking fleas, I would have to disclose that, right? <laughs> get rid of the dog, right? <laughs> Um, insulation containing asbestos, right? That answer your question? Yeah. Yes, it does. So it's, it's a very open-ended. There's no positive or negative. Yeah. And so your job as the agent, right? Your job as the agent is to not, like, put too much opinion on stuff. Your job is to present and make sure they know and see if they're okay with it. Because sometimes we try to think for the client, right? Like, if someone died in the property and you're like super superstitious, right? And you're like, hey, someone died in the property. You probably don't want to live here. There might be ghosts, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> right? Like, but there's there's people that probably do that, right? Or it's like now you're injecting your opinion, and or versus saying like, hey guys, you know, just want to bring up to your attention that someone died in the property. It was all natural causes. How do you guys feel about that? Yeah, done. Right. So your job is to present because someone may be okay, someone may not be okay. Hey, this property has fleas, right? They're my friends. <laughs> oh, no way, <laughs> right? Like I've had a dog, I had fleas before. I don't want a house that has fleas, right? Or hey, that's cool, but I'm gonna offer 10 grand less. Like this might be an opportunity for us, right? We might get a deal on this property, right? Or hey, like the AC is like about to go out. 
right? Well, hey, cool. Can we negotiate that, right? You know, so there's different there's different things. But if I inject my opinion and I'm swaying the client, you know, then I'm not necessarily doing the best for the client. Now, if I know something about the client where they've told me specifically that this is what they're looking for, this is what they're not looking for. And I'm like, hey, guys, this has that issue. You had told me you're not looking for this. This is probably not the one for you. That's where now you're giving them advice based off what they told you they wanted. Right. Does that makes sense. So you want to be an advisor, right? You want to be an advisor. You want to help them figure out the information. You want to present it. And then you want to ask the questions. Hey, how do you guys feel about this? Is this something you guys are okay with? Or should we move on to something else? Right. And let the client decide. What do you want time? One o'clock. I'm done. All right. Any last questions, guys? Good. Did you learn something today? Did you give one piece of advice? Yes. On the disclosure IL guide, you can go on there and send the um, disclosures to you. I always recommend that you add your buyers because any time the listing agent adds an addendum, updates a disclosure, or does any change to that link, it automatically sends it to your client. Mm -hmm. Versus the contrary, if you just have it going to you, the update's coming to you, but if you forget to send it to your client with those updates, they're not in the loop or they're not up to date with all the new updates that are going on. Yeah. So just include them on the disclosure IO. That way it's any updates or any changes, they're already receiving it. Yeah. And that that is common sometimes. Sometimes like they put the house on the market. They didn't have the reports yet. They had everything else, but they were missing the inspections and the house is already on the market and they're already taking offers. And then they add those last minute and you didn't see those in the beginning. So sometimes reports and disclosures are coming in late. Um, so you want to make sure you have everything up to date. A reminder, um, what's kind of like the time frame that you have, like, let's say write an offer is not contingent. And then hypothetically, <laughs> let's say you get the HRA docs after if it's been accepted. What's kind of like the window within that you have? So if you receive a disclosure after that's later on, that resets the clock. Right. So even if you submitted a non contingent offer and then they accept your offer and they're like, oh, Francisco, by the way, here's another set of disclosures. I think you automatically get five or seven days to review those. So you automatically have an inspection contingency added. Right. right. And it's in the contract. It says in the contract. Right. Um, right. So that can work out in your favor. Some agents don't know that. And then they send you stuff that's later or they give you a packet that's incomplete. And then they accept your offer and then they go, oh, here's the th reports. Hey, that's a new disclosure. You just gave me seven days and I could back out if I want to because I'm within my time period now. All right. So remember, the more that you know the contract and you know how it works and you know the little loopholes and, and the details, you use that in your favor. Right. So that actually happened to me with NBC property. Yeah. So I said, you made a set of disclosures and everything. And then after they said, so. CCMR pack and it wasn't in their description. They tried to put it in. Um, right, but technically, you have like some time to yeah. still commit or not commit because they didn't know about CCMRs and they didn't let us know the list of documents they had. It was not included. Yeah. I like, thought it was CCMR, but it's an HOA. I'm like, ah. It just runs with the property. They're like back in the 70s. Yeah. But it's just, it's been built the property before. Yeah, it's when they built it. And we we'll drive. I said, um, he was like, yeah, it's cool. I read him. It's like, I just can't have a horse in the house. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, the the old yeah, the old ones. Um, he's like, no, nah, don't, don't like start anything. Yeah. We're fine. We'll sign that's them. But I just had to hear that they didn't sign all disclosures. And they would not accept them. So it happens. But we reset that. So we reset the clock. So we don't have time. Because we didn't know about this when we signed everything. Yeah. Uh, but he was for the same thing. Yeah. So then, but now you have the option, right? So if something is disclosed to you after, now that resets your clock, now it's up to you what you want to do with that. Hey, we're fine with this. Or hey, maybe you get something you're like, hey, like this changes everything for us, right? Like if I can't have a horse on this house, I want to have a horse. I don't want the house now, right? So that happened to us with our listing in Hollister. We didn't have the solar agreement or the water softener agreement because mm -hmm. it was just taking forever. Yeah. And the agent um, submitted the offer, but they reserved the, the contingency for the solar and the water softener. Yeah. But so we sent it to them the day of that we got in contract. That's when we got everything in. So the next day I said, are your clients ready to remove that by 
final contingency. So I wasn't giving them the five days. Mm -hmm. I was pressing for them to remove it. And she said, yes, we're removing this out for signature. They're good. Yeah. So remember, solar on a property is a disclosure. If you have a solar lease that's attached to the property, right? If it's free and clear and it's owned, then it's right. But if it's a lease, then the buyer has to know about that. Yeah. And I had that too bite us in the butt one time where the solar company was lagging on sending us the the contract and all the different things that they had. And so, but the client wanted to hurry up and put the house on the market, right? And then so we got it after the fact and we were already in contract. And then that caused the whole like um, domino effect where the buyer wanted to renegotiate now, right? So that's why it's always important when you're representing sellers, get everything up front before you put the house on the market. A lot of times we're trying to hurry up and list properties, but it really can, you know, bite you in the butt if you're like, you have your disclosures late and now you got offers and now that changes your ability to negotiate right, on your seller's behalf. All right, guys, we're going to wrap this up here. I hope you guys got some value out of this. Um, really quick before we end, give me a couple hands. What's one thing you learned today? One thing that stood out? Um, I think I've worked with the material facts are. Okay. Uh, Okay. More understanding of what material facts are. All right, a couple other hands. What you, which one thing that stood out that you learned? Additional um, docs disclosed after acceptance. Okay, additional docs resets the clock. Yep. What else, guys? Insurance claims stick with the property. What else? Reserve funding. Talk to your lender, right? Anybody else? Anything that stood out for you guys? No. Uh, disclose everything if you know it. Disclose everything if you know it. It's always better to disclose, right? Especially when you're representing a seller. You don't want something coming back after the fact. Uh, good stuff, guys. Let's clap it up for showing up today. We'll do part two um, next week, and then we'll go through the actual reports.